This is disconcerting. I hope you all can hear through the headset. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Bryn O'Donnell, and I am a social impact program manager over at the Filecoin Foundation and Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. And I'm here to tell you today about our work building, protecting, and preserving the digital commons and how decentralized storage plays a critical role in that. So to start, I wanted to give you an overview into what Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, or FFDW, is. It's a 501c3 nonprofit based out of volunteers from the Filecoin Foundation, and we actively partner and collaborate with leading initiatives across the D-Web and Web3 movement. And that entails everyone from coders and developers to activists, archivists, educators, galleries, universities, museums, communicators, etc. In fact, we have over 30 different community project partner organizations um, as part of that community with us that help us to achieve some high-level goals. And within those community stakeholders, we support them financially, technically, and through intentional collaboration. And so with this community of project partners, we are aiming to achieve three high-level things. The first is to build, protect, and preserve the digital commons. The second is to showcase and identify the benefits of decentralized storage for social good initiatives. And finally, we want to figure out how to leverage Web3 web technologies to empower and serve global needs. And I'm going to dive into each of these in a little bit more detail. So this first one, building, protecting, and preserving the digital commons. We believe that it's important that we preserve humanity's most important information by building a digital, decentralized, and resilient archive. And to that end, many of our project partners have begun to upload critical information onto decentralized storage. And that has ranged from everything from moving image archives, legacies from activists across the globe, genocide testimonials from the UC Shoah Foundation, geospatial satellite content, and we're really only getting started. We have a lot more work in this area to do. We're also researching critical questions about the digital commons. For instance, what does digital commons ownership mean in the long run? In this shifting technological landscape, how can communities and community-centered design plan for and accommodate what digital commons ownership might mean over the course of a 100-year time frame? Secondly, we're really trying to identify and showcase the benefits of decentralized storage for social good initiatives. Decentralized storage is not just a cheaper, potentially more cost-effective way to store data. It has myriad other benefits as well. The first of which I'll mention is censorship mitigation. When data is distributed geographically in many different locations, it lends itself to potentially evading certain jurisdictional restrictions on that content. And so we're seeing this in, this in action uh, from some of our community stakeholders who are doing things like mirroring content that is restricted in Russia onto P2P platforms like IPFS. Others within our community are supporting investigative journalism by increasing access to primary source documents, largely obtained through Freedom of Information Act requests, and putting that onto decentralized storage so activists and journalists can continue to resiliently access those. The second benefit is transparency and auditability. Blockchain-based storage systems create a provable public statement that data and files haven't been tampered with or altered during storage or retrieval. And so folks are leveraging this in the preservation and authentication of documentation of human rights injustices across the globe. So one of our project partners, who is going to be talking a bit more about this tomorrow, actually took documentation of war crimes happening on the front lines in Ukraine, stored that on blockchain and decentralized storage, and then submit that evidence to the International Criminal court, and that is the first ever dossier of evidence of that kind to leverage blockchain for its verification and authentication potential to be leveraged in such a way. Other groups are working with community-based uh, decentralized mobile media archiving initiatives and trying to figure out how decentralized technologies fit into their work. 
And then finally, data that is stored in a distributed fashion and redundantly lends itself to resiliency because we're avoiding those single points of failure. And so we're seeing this in the fight against link rot. A 2021 study done by Harvard Law School and the New York Times looked at over 2 million URLs. And they found that over 25% of those were either completely broken or no longer pointed to accurate sources. And this has serious ramifications when you think about it, especially in the context of something like legal precedents. When earlier case citations are no longer valid or linked to inaccurate sources, um, that, could be, that could be serious. And so some folks within our community are trying to empower authors and scholars to preserve their citations from link rot by hosting them decentralized and redundantly and resiliently um, by giving them web archiving tools. Lastly, we really want to leverage Web3 technology to empower and serve global needs. And so a big part of that is ensuring that the global audience is brought along on this journey with us. And so we do that through a myriad of education initiatives. And our education work is primarily twofold. The first is trying to educate the public. And that has looked like everything from online curriculum for creators and artists or online cur curriculum for educational organizations to figure out how to really leverage and use Web3 technology to bolster their work. We also believe that educating policymakers is critical. When these legislators are crafting regulations about these technologies, it's critical that they're informed. And so we have placed technology fellows into congressional offices. Some are creating an open source blockchain law program, and others are, we've partnered with our nonprofits at that intersection of public policy and tech. Lastly, we really believe in including diverse communities in this space. We in Web3 talk a lot about building a better internet, you know, by the people and for the people. But in order to make sure that that happens, we have to make sure that diverse voices are brought along on this journey with us, especially those that have been traditionally disenfranchised from the technology space. And so we're partnering with folks to bring underrepresented communities into the Web3 space. We're also partnering with human rights groups that are conducting market research on how different activists across the globe might leverage these technologies for their work. And then finally, some are looking into trying to figure out civil society's gaps and needs towards advancing digital equity. So what's, what's next for FFDW? What does the future look like? That's some of the things we're, we're doing now. And firstly, we're going to continue to support those project partners that are doing that fantastic and incredible work. One of our main objectives in our partnerships with them is to help them overcome any challenges they might encounter and help their project achieve success, however that might be defined per project. And not all of them are building on Filecoin or IPFS, but for those that are, a critical part of us supporting them is ensuring that we are connecting them with the right people and the right initiatives in this space to help them elevate their projects and also overcome any technological challenges where possible. And so this is my sort of ask to you all for the workshop -y board section after. If any of these projects I briefly mentioned seem like they might resonate with you, your work, your initiative, please do come and chat about how we might connect you with some of our project partners. And then finally, we are going to be continuing to expand our community of folks uh, helping us achieve these high-level goals. And we are going to be issuing an open request for proposals, or RFP, in early 2023 to continue to look for others that want to join us on this journey. And so please do stay in touch and stay tuned, uh, both in regards to that RFP opportunity and also to stay abreast of all the fantastic work of this community of project partners. And you can do that by following us on Twitter, reading our blog, shooting us an email if you have questions, and then, of course, coming to the board section afterwards to talk about this. And then finally, I wanted to end my talk today by plugging some talks tomorrow. Um, so I teased some of the projects very briefly, but tomorrow a bunch of them are going to be diving into more depth on their work. And so these are some of the fantastic community partners that we have. Here is the title of their talks and the time, uh, so make sure you check that out. Thank you so much. Meet me at the backboard. Thank you so much, Bryn O'Donnell, ladies and gentlemen, and I 
do admit, like, um, you know, we have no favorites at the Falcon Foundation, but the Falcon Foundation of the Decentralized Web is my favorite favorite. Now, if you want to save the world, if you came into this ecosystem because of its amazing potential to help journalists, um, human rights defenders, and activists preserve the most important information that humanity has, I beseech you, I urge you, like one of those sort of charitable requests, to uh, follow Bryn and go backstage, um, back to the seats behind you. Um, you can pick up and go now, and um, you can find out more about what Bryn's doing, and you can volunteer time to FFDW, or you can just uh, find out how the projects you're working on can connect with some of the um, social impact work that FFDW does on a, on a daily basis. Um, it's super interesting because every time I talk, everybody's ears glow. Um, for instance, if, if for the rest of you, if you don't realize it, though, um, if you put on the headsets, you'll be able to hear each of the individual talks, um, so you'll understand what everybody is applauding about. So you feel free to put on headsets. And for those of you who are already part of the Borg hive mind that it seems to be from my point of view, I'd like to introduce one of the great personalities of the Falcon ecosystem. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ruben Amanyogba. May I have my slides, please? Lovely. All right. Um, yeah, excited to meet all of you. Good morning. Um, my name is Ruben, and I lead Builders Program at Protocol Labs. I have one objective today. I would like to tell you about the end-to-end -end support that Protocol Labs and Falcon provides to all the amazing builders in our ecosystem. Specifically, I'm going to talk through the builder's funnel, and I'll highlight two specific pieces of the builder's funnel, which are accelerators and pre-seed investments. So as you kind of engage with the Protocol Labs ecosystem, you might want to you know, attend a hackathon. We have massive partnerships with uh, the ETH Globals of the world, HackFS, Chainlink. And you might want to lean in further. You might come together as a team, and you want to realize that vision. This is when you move on from the hackathon stage to the open grant stage. We have a huge grant program within Protocol Apps and the Falcon Foundation. These are split up into what we call micro-grants, which are small follow-on grants that are available to builders that are rolling over from hackathons, from university programs, from education programs such as BuildSpace. Open grants are larger grants, up to $100,000, that we provide for builders that have higher ambitions, right? that want to contribute to the open source community. However, if you really come together with your team and you decide that you want to realize a startup vision, you might be looking for investments. You might be looking for real equity and token venture capital to put your ambition into reality. So this is where my team and I come in. And we have a number of kind of sub-brands that supercharge your vision. First is the Accelerator program. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail here. But generally speaking, what we do is we partner with the foremost names in the ecosystems, the tech stars, the Fabers, the Long Hash Ventures, notable venture capital firms, and create multi-week Accelerator programs to supercharge your growth. Second, we have SoftNoise, which is a platform that aggregates investors on one side and startups on the other side and brings them together to make sure that the builders and the ecosystem are well capitalized. Secondly, we have the Builders Fund. It's kind of fund one-on-one, -on -one, pre-seed investments into the strongest builders in the ecosystem. And then lastly, and I'm super excited, we have PhilVC. And we had the first PhilVC this year in Singapore, we brought together more than 300 investors, 26 startups from our ecosystem, put them into a single room, and really had them you know, pitch on stage um, to, 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 to the best investors um, uh, in the space. So there are two brands that I'm going to a little bit of detail in, two kind of programs that we do. First is the Accelerator program. What a lot of people don't know 
is that Protocol Labs, now a billion dollar company, started out as an accelerator company itself. We were part of Y Combinator, one of the you know, foremost accelerator programs worldwide. Notable companies such as Stripe, Airbnb, Uber came out of Y Combinator. And yeah, we are part of that kind of eclectic list um, uh, of companies that Y Combinator incubated. So we learned a lot and we are still very close to that ecosystem. We've learned from them, and we are very, very proud to say that we have really been supercharging our accelerator efforts in the last year. We have more than 10x the number of companies that are running through our accelerator programs, and as you can see, many of them are moving on to secure massive seed rounds, massive series A, B, C, and beyond rounds um, out there, which is a massive validation of our startups um, in the market. Now, what is an accelerator? Many of you will be familiar with you know, what it is, how it feels, but many of you won't. So I will quickly like, double click a little bit into what that entails. So an accelerator, think about it as, a, as an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, program that normally kind of the archetype is three months, you're going to be, you and your team are going to be flown in, you'll be co-located with other amazing builders that are selected for a specific cohort in Seattle, New York. We have programs in Singapore, Singapore, we have programs in London, here in Lisbon. You're going to be co-located for about three months and you are going to build. And what we do is we are bringing you together with the foremost experts in the, in the system, in the entire ecosystem of Web3. This is not just Filecoin. And we bring them in for weekly sessions, one-on-one -on -one mentor sessions, to address all the things that you need to learn as a founder. How to hire how to fundraise, how to find product market fits, how to go to market, how to build culture, how to build a brand. All these things are things that we teach in a three months kind of intensive if you want to. And afterwards, you're building for this massive, massive demo day event, which we um, invite all of our investor networks to, which our partners invite all of their investor networks to. And then you pitch, and then you pitch. And what we have seen, we have seen massive success in how well the companies that pitch at Demo Day are capitalized three months out of the program. End of year last year, the number of companies that were fully capitalized after uh, three months after Demo Day was at 80%. So massive success here on how our uh, startups perform straight out of program. The natural or organic follow-on question that you might ask is, okay, so how can I get involved? What is it that I need to bring to take part in one of these accelerator programs that we organize year-round? Well, there are a number of health checks. I can't go into too much detail because I'm looking at the clock, but there are three kind of main buckets that you need to address in your application to the program. Bucket number one is desirability, and I can't stress this enough, desirability. We want to see an idea that is solving an actual friction out there in the market. If anywhere on these three you over-index, please over-index on desirability. Show me that you are solving a friction, show me and my team that you are solving a friction and a recurring friction out there in the market. Viability, how does it make money? You should have, at least have an idea of how you're going to you know, capitalize and recapitalize your business. And then lastly, feasibility. Can it be built? What is the solution architecture you chose? Why did you choose it? And are you the right team to build it? I promised you to briefly double click on Phil VC. So Phil VC was an event we put on in Singapore. More than 300 investors, 300 individual funds we brought flew into Singapore. It was a full day event. Our startups pitched in rapid fire pitches, three minutes max, and they got out of a single day, out of a single pitch, the equivalent of what you would need to do in three months, you know, riding up and down Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley. 
So if this excites you, if you're excited about supercharging and concentrating your startup growth, please find me afterwards. I'm going to be somewhere back there. I think I'm going to have somewhat of a stand. Please come talk to me. Please come talk to my team. I'll be excited to hear more from you. Here are a number of email addresses that you can reach out to. It's been my pleasure to connect with you, and I would love to get to know you more. Thank you. Thanks to Ruben, um, the sound suddenly magically goes up, I have the voice of God. If you're out there and you're thinking to yourself, is my hearing going? Why can't I hear what Ruben is saying? Um, it's because you don't have a headset. Go grab a headset and come and sit down because we still have a huge set of amazing uh, talks and projects that you might be interested in. And as Ruben says, like if you've been praying for the moment that you can bump into somebody uh, like Ruben or exactly like Ruben so you can talk about accelerating your hackathon or demo project, into a, a real live company. Um, grab him, he's got a flipboard, he's got coffee, he's got um, time to chat with you now. So um, we, we're gonna crack ahead. I'd like to introduce one of the most um, intense and great thinkers at Protocol Labs, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Thiam. Hello, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining the silent disco. This is the first time I'm doing something like that. Consider an ASMR kind of situation, but yeah, we'll go ahead with a talk and I'll spare you from that. So um, a little bit about me, nice to meet all of you. I'm Sarah from the FVM uh, developer experience team. I'm a developer advocate. Uh, the team will be around the whole day and we'll be at the back taking questions. So if any of this interests you and you want to find out more, you can find us at the back. Okay, so uh, for, I mean, you've probably been hearing the word FVM going around as a buzzword. Uh, if you're not sure what it is yet, it's the Filecoin Virtual Machine. Uh, TLDR, the Filecoin Virtual Machine, delivers on uh, on chain programmability to the Filecoin network. And so what that means is that now you will be able to compute over state, over state metadata um, to, uh, across the Filecoin network uh, to access all the storage deals that are there. Um, and then you can have a full server stack. So that is the kind of potential that we'll have. If you think about it, it, has the, it could potentially have the far-reaching impact that the EVM has also brought to the space. The difference being is that now you will have programmability around native storage primitives. And so that moves us further along the transition from a Web 2 space into Web 3. So you might be thinking, how does this work? Uh, very simply, and we have other talks and many other docs that go into uh, a lot deeper into the architecture and how it works. But briefly, um, conceptually, how it works is that you have Filecoin Network as a storage layer at L0, and then you have the FVM as an L1 layer, which is computation over state. And then on top of that, you would then, it, it would enable you to use it in any way that you need for your use cases, and you can then build L2 layers over that. And so there are a lot of use cases that you can think about you know, and that's really for you to imagine and build out with your team. To give a sense, the Falcon, machine, uh, Falcon Virtual Machine is built natively in Rust. And so why we do that is so that it's a compiler language that allows you to, to, to program with different kinds of languages that you're comfortable with. So for example, as of today, the FVM is actually launched onto the Falcon mainnet. Um, it is actually functional today. Uh, we're building up the capabilities week on week, and you'll see a full capable FVM by mid-year 2023. Uh, we have SDKs as of today that you can build with assembly script, high-level Rust, and TinyGo, and we're hoping that more teams will start building out SDKs for other developers to use as well. We're also accommodating for foreign runtimes. So right now, we're at a phase where our milestone is at 2.1. Uh, we're focused on the F EVM. So that would be the Filecoin EVM. Uh, we, are fully, we, are, we aim to be a fully EVM-compatible FEM. Uh, what that allows you to do is that if you're comfortable with the Ethereum ecosystem, you want to deploy your EVM smart contracts there, uh, it should, it, it's intended to be a seamless deployment out of the box into the EVM, uh, FEM to then access all the capabilities uh, from the Filecoin storage network. OK, so I hope that got you a little bit excited about what the FVM is and what it can do. Um, what I'll do today is kind of dive into what some of the ideas that have been coming up or already being built and talk a little bit about an early builders program. Uh, we're approaching this very, very differently, uh, where we don't want people to just build with the product we've already 
build ourselves, but we want them to build the product with us. And so we've opened up a program called the Foundry Early Builders Program. We have a cohort of about 100 teams as of now. We're still taking in more. A lot of them are focused on the FEVM phase that I've just mentioned. So if you're a Solidity dev, that's something that you should definitely be looking out for. We will open up a different cohort for um, user-defined smart contracts that are native in the FEVM later on. So I'll go through a little bit around some of the use cases. Um, but to give you a conceptual map, these are a lot of different things that you could build with the FVM. Honestly, endless, it's up to you to imagine. Right? So you have like perpetual storage. Uh, you have you know, ways that you could really enhance storage and retrieval markets, uh, injecting automation into it with like repair workers, replication workers. Uh, so your deals could also be auto-renewable without you having to manually reset it every single time. Uh, it also injects a lot of trust and confidence into uh, decentralized networks. So things like trustless reputation systems. Uh, how do we certify that like a provider is someone credible? Um, and so that can reduce a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, re reduce a lot of the questions that we have. I think also you will, you will be able to incentivize user behaviors to be to be moving in the right way. So with storage providers, retrieval providers, as well as node operators, you could come out with different protocols to incentivize the right behaviors for users and providers themselves. OK, so I'll spend some time running through the projects that are being built as of now. Um, through the FVM Early Builder, Foundry Early Builders program, we've seen two large categories kind of form out. One is around tooling. Um, so we have a lot of teams that are building out dev tooling with us today. Uh, SDKs, as I mentioned earlier, I'm just naming some of these teams here. So if you're interested, you know, take out your phone, do a quick search, find out more about them. They're really, really great to work with. Um, SDKs from Zondex, Polyphene, IPFS Force. Uh, those were the SMD script, Tiny Go, and high level REST SDKs that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, so you know, if we have more teams building out more SDKs for the communities and the languages that you love, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, block explorers to, with FE, FEVM support and FVM support. We have Glyph, uh, Fill Explorer. We have a few more block explorers being built at the moment. Um, we hope to see many more in the ecosystem. Uh, there are things like multi-addressing that we're looking at. So how can we allow um, not just a block explorer to aggregate the data, but also for providers themselves to, or users themselves to put out all the different addresses that they have tagged to their actor ID uh, within the FVM. So that will allow more, uh, a much easier way to discover different providers and users. Testnets, uh, Wallaby testnet is one really, really important testnet. So if you want to go back and start experimenting on the FVM today, definitely check that out. Do a quick search, Wallaby FVM, find us at the back of the room. This is something that you can start building out as of today. Uh, we have pre-compiles, wallet integration, no implementations. We're looking for more uh, cross-chain communications to be built out as well so that we can enable uh, more within the ecosystem to use FVM. Again, I don't think we come in as a competitor to different chains. We are very much looking to complement them and bring that kind of storage capability to the smart contracts that are being deployed today. Uh, ENS alternatives that are being built for um, Filecoin itself. And zk snark capability, like for example, the Lurk language that some of you might have come across, uh, is being built out within Protocol Labs as well. We are hoping to insert zk snark capability into the FVM. So with more tooling, we can definitely get a much more powerful FVM, and we really look forward to building that together with the community. And I'll go into layer two applications. So these are where a lot of the teams are coming in with their ideas and building out really useful scenarios and solutions. Uh, we have, you know, in-house, we have Compute Over Data, Bakayal, IPC, Medusa. All these are looking at how they can use the FVM for either coordination or to build in capabilities into the FVM uh, for others to use. Perpetual storage and storage aggregation are big use cases. So how can we allow for, well, not perma storage, but perpetual storage uh, using an endowment pool within uh, coordination of the endowment pool so that your storage can be stored perpetually without you having to uh, worry about it being lost or the deal ending without you actually realizing it. Uh, storage aggregation, so you know, can we have we have Spare Network looking into it and Banyan on how we can automatically aggregate some of the the, star, uh, the data that's coming in. So if you have a smaller amount of data, you don't have to wait really long for like a deal aggregator to put it together to store it on the network. Uh, and of course, many others. Um, these are a whole list of ideas that can go on and on, and I will at the back. Um, but we have access control, data DAOs creations, and so you can think of all these different layer two applications that can be used in many different scenarios. 
For example, uh, we have a little bit more industry-specific applications that are being built out by teams. So let's take a look at, for example, uh, Legacy, a data DAO for social media. So that's how you can store some of your uh, memoirs onto uh, a per per perpetual storage page, and you can have that data live on for a long, long time. Right? So they're also looking at how they can work together with teams that are providing access control, teams that are providing st perpetual storage. And so there's a lot of cross usage across teams as well to build out these, uh, these solutions. Um, I'm also going to give a mention to Huddle01. Uh, they have very, very cool decentralized video meetings. You can use it as of today as a replacement for Zoom. Um, and then 3D asset storage, um, 3D asset tokenization within the metaverse. Uh, health data storage from Bella Supernova um, is an interesting one. OK, um, my last slide. So I mentioned a little bit about the FVM early, uh, Foundry Early Builders program earlier on. Uh, what you can expect from that is kind of a six-month cohort. We started in October. You can join as a rolling application. Uh, knowledge, again, we're, we're releasing weekly. So it's not like you'll miss out on a lot of knowledge. Um, so you know, if you have a really good use case, you're, solid, you're using EVM today, join in on the program, uh, apply. We take in teams that are focused on solidity at this point uh, and have experience with EVM infrastructure and, and smart contracts and want to deploy that to FVM. It's a weekly check-in, and we'll have full support from the team uh, yeah, to make sure that you build out your projects. So yeah, thank you very much. everyone. Um, Sarah, like all of our speakers, will be uh, right at the back. And so if you want to get in on the ground floor of the FEM, find out whether the ideas that you have are practical right now, or maybe have some features built into the FEM to enable you to create amazing applications. Sarah is the person to talk to. OK, we're going to bang straight ahead. And I'm very proud to introduce our next speaker, who is Nicola Greco. Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you can hear me. This is Nicola, and I'm the lead at CryptoNet Lab. And I'm talking on behalf of Alex, who unfortunately cannot be here today. And, and the presentation is uh, made by him. This is all of his work. I'm just here to communicate most of his ideas. So the talk today will be about uh, future uh, directions for the Filecoin protocol. And the, the focus will be on interoperability. So we all know by now the Filecoin master plan. I think that the, this has been communicated over and over again. And the first step is uh, hardware, build the world's largest decentralized storage network. The second one is onboard the humanities data. And finally, compute. So at CryptoNet, and uh, I think many other teams, have focused very hard in the past two years to achieve goal number one and do really hard work for goal number two. We have 16 exabytes of data after all, and there is hundreds of petabytes being stored for user data. So there's a lot of protocol upgrades that we're planning to improve uh, pipeline for one and pipeline for two. But today, we're going to talk in, particularly, in particular about the pipeline for number three, the improvement proposals for uh, achieving compute to bring more data closer to the computation, and as we will see, also the other way around. So the Filecoin protocol improves every year. We have only this year, there's been more than seven protocol upgrades that CryptoNet, by, the, by ourselves, we propose. And there is many more uh, protocol upgrades that have been proposed this year, and they're coming up for next year. The goal for these protocol upgrades are to make Filecoin more efficient, bringing more secure storage, and more broadly provide greater storage utility and new capabilities. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the, the next goal, as we're going to talk about, is the, uh, how do we improve the compute. So the Filecoin uh, virtual machine is a perfect example of how we're going to get there. Uh, we're bringing smart contracts straight into Filecoin. We're going to enable uh, compute close uh, to the data. And because we can, access, uh, file, we can access not only the Filecoin state from the, from the FVM, but in theory, uh, whenever we're going to have uh, more tools available to the FVM, we're able to access storage directly. And we can uh, generate proofs about storage, and then we can compute uh, 
uh, compute about data that we can uh, expose to the Filecoin virtual machine. Um, Filecoin virtual machine fo allows for m a vast um, set of uh, new opportunities to appear in the Filecoin network. For example, new storage market, perpetual storage, uh, replication and repair, and also a whole new category of products which we call storage finance protocols. They could be users that buy and sell storage capacity even before filling the storage capacity with something. The Filecoin virtual machine focused on uh, mostly on Filecoin state. That's how we bring uh, computation close to, this, uh, close to the data. But what happens when we want to do larger computation on uh, larger uh, data? We cannot do them on-chain. So the way, the way we'll compute, we'll compute off-chain. This, this project that is called Bacalao, and there's other projects alongside Bacalao, but Bacalao in particular. And the goal is to schedule decentralized computation. And once we could use uh, several ways to schedule it, and what I expect to achieve is that we will have a network like a MapReduce network, where we can do large scale on big data, and this does improve the storage utility of Filecoin. But like what we talked about so far is bringing computation to the data, and I want to talk about a paradigm switch here, which is bring data closer to the computation. What, what, what do I mean here? So. Uh, before I dive into this slide, I want to take a step back and see from, um, uh, from in, in the high level what's happening in Web3. We have layer ones and layer twos are uh, focusing on improving more and more this uh, execution layer. And so you can think of this as every L1 and L2s as if they are the computers of their own, these world computers that allow for anyone to write into them, anyone to participate in their governance. But L1 and L2, if we were looking at big operating system, they would be the, the, the CPUs. And the, 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 the state that these L1s and L2s would be the RAM or, or the cache. And then the way different world, com world computers talk to each other is by uh, these bridges. And bridges, you can think of this as uh, messaging uh, and I.O. And what is Filecoin in this big picture of a world computer, um, of, of uh, these Web3 world computers talking to each other, accessing their own RAM and so on? Well, the way we would like to position Filecoin is that Filecoin is the hard disks of all of these, lay all, all of these compute, uh, compute, uh, world computers. So the, the moment you start getting into this uh, mindset, then of course, Filecoin is still layer one, but there is other layer ones that can improve as, fast, as, uh, as much as possible their own capabilities as layer one by providing uh, parallelization, faster execution, and so on. And so we can split responsibility and also split focus. And the, way we, the beauty of this is that uh, all in a sudden, uh, Filecoin can be a hard disk that can be plugged into any world computer that can specialize on any specific uh, functionality. And in this way, Filecoin does not only provide storage to their own uh, Filecoin users, but can provide storage for any other chain. Let me give you an example. Say that a DAO on Ethereum decides to preserve important information for themselves. Well, they don't have to move the DAO to uh, Filecoin for this. But they can, if we would have good interoperability, then they would be able to store on Filecoin straight from Ethereum. So in this world where everyone will need more storage because we, there's very little that we can do on, uh, on a chain state, then um, we can see the value of, uh, of, provide, of exporting storage to other chains. So how do we plan to do this uh, now that we've seen that it's valuable? So we're planning as CryptoNet and other teams this interoperability roadmap. And there is two big steps in order to uh, get there. Step number one is to um, making sure that we can export the Filecoin state into other chains. So what does this mean? 
uh, every, in every block, we have this uh, state root hash that points to the, to the whole of the Filecoin state. Well, we need to export this hash into Ethereum. How do we do this? Well, there is many ways. Traditionally, there have been oracles or trusted nodes that do this. The goal, though, is that to avoid trusted nodes or oracles. Why? Because they're very often um, the issue of major attacks. And how do we get there? Well, if we can collect signatures of more than 51% of the Filecoin storage providers that sign that state root hash, then we could generate a proof about 51% agreeing that that's a correct checkpoint and post the proof of correct consensus or correct checkpoint into other chains. Ideally, these proofs are easy to verify, so they can be posted in Ethereum at a very low gas cost. OK, now we have the state root hash into fi from, from Filecoin into other chains. What do we do from now on? Well, the state root is a pointer to all the state of Filecoin. And if we had, this means that if we have good um, vector commitments, you can think of Merkle tree as a good vector commitment, but we can have better vector commitments, and vector commitment is a big topic for us at CryptoNet. Then what we can do, we can generate proofs that there is some state in the in the, th there is some, some entry in the Filecoin state that we care, that we want to expose to Ethereum. The moment that we can, the moment that we can prove that some state belongs to this particular state root hash, then we can access Filecoin state from other chains. And of course, doing the first problem, the, solving the first problem is going to be difficult, providing proof of consensus to other chain. And solving the other problem is also difficult. That's why we require a whole roadmap to try to tackle these two projects. But once we, once we get there, then we can read and write um, Filecoin state straight, straight from other chains. And we believe that this will enable um, mutual benefit across chains. Because let me tell you, it's not a core responsibility of a chain like uh, Ethereum or other chains to provide uh, long-term storage solutions. And we expect that that's the core property that we can uh, deliver in Filecoin, among, uh, not only just in the Filecoin network, and we should try to export this. And you know, uh, network effects really improve utility and security. The more, the more, um, the more people um, uh, the more people use Filecoin storage, uh, the better it is for the Filecoin network. And the Filecoin network can uh, just uh, uh, be as a little country that export what they're really good at in other chains. So this was one of the many protocol upgrades that we would like to uh, propose that we, uh, in next year in the, in the Filecoin Improvement Proposal Forum. And if you want to learn more about what we do, you can go on cryptonet.org. Or otherwise, you can find me at the table at that corner over there. Thanks, everyone. Well, just to remind everybody who is suddenly going, I can finally hear again. I can hear this person speaking, but I couldn't hear anything else. The reason is, is because all of the in crowd here um, have headphones. And if you want to hear more of our lightning talks, um, pop on a headphone and uh, either come here. Or I actually saw somebody going to the bathroom wearing one of them, which is, you know, good, good, good multitasking, I guess. Um, our speakers, um, including Nicola, um, will be over in the corner where the flipboards are. So if you want to find out more about um, Crypto Labs plans, um, go and talk to Nicola. If you want to find out more about the FEM, talk to uh, Sarah. If you want to talk about getting uh, more money, uh, talk to Ruben. Um, and if you want to talk about changing the world and uh, uh, connecting your tools and uh, your skill set to uh, uh, help protect human rights defenders, journalists, activists, and all the things that maybe you got involved in this whole Web3 thing to, uh, to pursue, um, talk to Bryn O'Donnell, who is also around in the back. Um, but we'll crack on now, and I'd love to introduce you now to uh, our guest speaker from Secured Finance AG, uh, Massa. Thank you. Hello, Filecoin. Can you hear me? Hello, Lisbon. 
Uh, I'm Secure Finance founder, Masa, and uh, I want to talk about uh, what we are building. So uh, I'm from finance, and finance is all about abstraction of the human uh, ecosystem ec uh, activity. And uh, so today I want to talk about uh, hedging. So what is hedging? It's basically, um, even for me, I have more than 17 years of uh, traditional finance, but for me, still, it's very hard to predict the future. But uh, our product can offer you a hedging solution so you can at least lock the future so you don't need to worry about the future price. So how we can build it? And I want to help you uh, grow your business. So as you can see, um, now the market is kind of quite volatile, but I think we have to prepare the next bull run because once price going back, you want to lock the price. So you have to prepare now. And uh, so actually this is the very old chart, which is 40 years ago. Uh, it's about uh, 1976 to 1981. Uh, 40 years ago, there's a very first uh, currency swap between IBM and the World Bank. And this swap is arranged by Solomon Brothers. And um, they invented a great idea of locking the uh, price, uh, forward effects, and then since then, derivative markets became the world's largest market in the world. And we want to build the largest market in the cryptocurrency space. So first, our product is lending market. We build a lending market for Filecoin. So currently, DeFi, Filecoin wants a lending market. And of course, Bitcoin, uh, stablecoin wants a lending market. DeFi plays uh, well in the short term area, which is money market, but we want to extend maturity to up to five years. And we strategically chose four major cryptocurrencies, which has the largest uh, transaction volume and potentials, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and um, USDC, USDT, and of course, Filecoin. Filecoin, as you can see, shows a very interesting yield curve, right? So this means I can actually talk hundreds of transaction idea, hedging idea, but uh, well, let's talk about it later on uh, on our table. And so here's a, just like an overview of the landscape over like a DeFi projects. Right now, lots of DeFi projects build a pool-based interest rates, spot market, a lending market on the money market side. Money market is actually less than one year market. There's no capital market space player, uh, more than one year space. And there's a clear reason, but uh, we, we provi uh, provided some kind of solution to build the capital market for digital assets. So just compare, what is money market? What is capital market? So to give you some example, money market is basically a deposit market. You put money in a pool, and then it's the usage ratio will give you interest rates. That's DeFi, right? While capital markets are a bit more complex, this is a bond market, it has a maturity, longer term maturity and duration, lots of like a mathematics plays out. And uh, so money market is more like a retail banking business, and a capital market is more like an investment banking business that require um, a bit of a, a wisdom. So our team is a group of uh, finance experts bringing this knowledge in to build the capital markets. And uh, in another words, money market mostly is a spot market. There's no secondary market. On the other hand, capital markets, because of long-term maturity, we can build forward market. And uh, this is a the very powerful market, which usually more than 30 times larger scale than the spot market. So this is just a summary. For the spot market, because spot execute right now, there's no secondary market. Buy now, sell now, no future obligations. So it's not, not possible to do a hedging solution, and there's, there's no need to develop a standard. But for forward market, we need to guarantee the future obligation, buy later, sell later. It's like a promise for the future. So we need something 
uh, like a standard way. So traditionally, we have is the master agreement and something. So we bring this knowledge and then deploy it as a smart contract so we can provide a hedging solution. So uh, the DeFi projects, you know, like Aave started out of peer-to-peer -peer lending. So peer-to-peer -peer means like a lender versus borrower. So borrower and lender has to agree on the interest rates or all the terms, and uh, they have to manage counterparty risk. And uh, actually, when it comes to unwind or cancel or return early, you have to negotiate again. That creates a very like a low liquidity in terms of market building. So DeFi created a very innovative idea of having smart contract counterparty pool in the middle. So the lender versus pool and borrower versus pool can solve the secondary market issue. That is a great idea of uh, the innovation for like a DeFi. And um, we, we want to do the same again, but uh, one problem is basically uh, the quality of interest rates. Let me explain. So let's say we want to build a yield curve and once we have a yield curve, but actually this is a one market. And we, once we have a yield curve as one market, which is $600 trillion, really massive scale, and how we can achieve that. And everyone wants to build it, right? So very, very basic. We, in the first, we have to connect yields. One year rates, two year rates, three year yields. It, it, it seems to be easy, but it's actually not easy. Let's say like a pool-based DeFi project can make one year pool and a three year pool. So the question is how you can come up with two-year interest rates, right? Seems to be easy, just interpolating one year, three year can give a two-year yields, but you know, remember, one-year interest rates is based on the usage ratio of the pool, and the three-year of the pool, usage ratio, there's no relationship between one-year pool and three-year pool, so we can't simply interpolate to get the two-year interest rate. That's a problem of the DeFi, and our case, we build order book system. So order book means like a open uh, liquidity, so we can ensure the same quality of the interest rate, so that we can assure you can interpolate, you can apply your mathematical model to come up with a very innovative solution on top of the yield curve. So that's what we are building. Once we have the uniform yield, arbitrage free pricing starts to work, so every mathematical model starts to work. That will bring composability of interest rates. Composability is really the key to build a, stru a, a structured product, such as forward loan. This is very simple, one year starting loan, but currently DeFi doesn't have this scalability. Never, nobody built it, right? So we, we're gonna do this. And also forward FX. You, you want to lock the future price like a one year later. I don't know how much is the Falcon price in the one year later, but we can actually theoretically price the forward FX price so that you can hedge the price. And of course we can make more like a complex swap transactions. And a swap is actually the combination of the same present value. So the swap is priced at zero. Zero pricing is really the key to reduce collateral. And the price is zero means it is off balance trade. And you can leverage because its price is zero. That's how traditional finance achieve billions to trillions. And that's crypto-based uh, DeFi project will in, bring from like a billions to trillions. That's what we want to achieve. So our product is, first one is loans. Filecoin lending market is the first thing to build a robust yield curve. Then the second step, we're gonna provide NDF, non durable forward. It's basically a forward market. So you can lock the future price, hedge the price, so you don't need to worry about the future, and you can focus on what you want to build. So here's a brief uh, video. Should be playing, but uh, let's see. Uh, I'll show you on the table later on. So here's a roadmap. We've been developing the lending market, and then we're going to launch our product early next year. Then we're going to expand our product to forward markets. Oh, now the video is playing. So we are developing a very user-friendly, like a Uniswap, like a user interface. So you can just uh, deposit your collateral, and based on the amount of collateral, you can borrow, or you can lend, or you can mix the borrow and lend uh, like a, over different maturity. So you can play the yield curve. So you, we have a lot of like, uh, analysis tools. So yeah, I can show you more. Uh, let's talk about more. 
And again, yeah, we are building a, a interbank grade peer-to-peer -peer capital markets for digital assets. So we are secure finance. Um, thank you very much. so much. Um, uh, that's one of the most intense lightning talks I've experienced for a while. It's like last week I was at PL Labs um, understanding zero knowledge proofs, and now I think I understand the entirety of capitalism. So if you'd like to talk more um, with Massa about um, uh, Yilco's lending and all of the financial instruments that are developing around the Falcoin economy, Massa, as with all our lightning talk guests, are over and they're allowed to talk in their outdoor voice over there with flipboards, um, and so uh, they'll be there for uh, the next uh, half hour or so um, before our main event starts at one o'clock. So we have one more speaker um, before everyone can flood to their favorite or their favorite favorite, and that's uh, Jay Chris Anderson from Protocol Labs. Jay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jay Chris. I've been working on the peer-to-peer -peer web since like 2008, and I'm lucky to be working with uh, Web3 Storage doing product. So I'm here to talk about the future of decentralized applications and data. We're all here because of a huge ongoing paradigm shift in computing. Paradigm shifts in computing come when the new ways make the old ways seem like a waste of time, right? Like, as a developer, when, when you have cloud brain, it starts to feel silly when you start to think about servers. Uh, this is the force behind the rise in serverless and microservices architectures. So where we are today, soon, like tomorrow, it will feel just as outmoded to be thinking in terms of cloud. The new paradigm of computing that we're creating abstracts the cloud away so the applications can be built in terms of data and compute instead of services and servers. So why now? What's driving that shift? Those of us who've been building the decentralized web for most of our careers have seen it getting better and better and more and more usable. And we're very excited about that. Um, what we've known is that at some time, the technology would cross the threshold where it makes sense for people who may not be as excited about their core tech to use this because it's cheaper, it's faster, it's easier, and it's more reliable than the centralized Web2 platforms. So that time is now. Congratulations, the future's here. Um, why? It's here because of the platform reach. We've got IPFS in browsers. We have so much Filecoin storage capacity. And we have all these new implementations of the protocols showing up all over the industry. Early use cases, like NFTs, are familiarizing the industry with the benefits of verifiable data. And I think maybe the interesting bit, ecosystem players are now coordinating on new protocols for application developers. So that means that innovation has graduated up the stack from infrastructure protocols to the application layer. And usually, that's a sign we're about to enter a golden era. So what does this new world feel like? We like to call it data anywhere. And you're all familiar with this if you've used IPFS, because instead of looking up data by the location of the server that owns it, in IPFS, data is looked up by the hash of its value. That's content addressing, and it's verifiable. So that means when you go to load a particular data item, you don't need to go uh, somewhere that may or may not be up at the time, you can just ask the network and whoever gives you the data fastest, you can verify that you can trust that response and use it. So that allows you to write applications in location independent ways. For example, 
When you upload to Web3 storage, you already know the content identifier, the CID in advance. You know what the address of your upload is going to be before you send it. And so that allows you, for instance, to schedule processing that could begin when the upload completes. And just like that, a whole class of race conditions goes away. So one reason that data anywhere is better. And really, not having to worry about where the data is located means that when you're writing applications, you could think about the important parts. So that's on the data side, but compute also just got an upgrade. How many folks here have heard of UCANs? Yeah. All right. So UCANs have been real popular in the hallway track the last few days. And uh, Web3 Storage has been collaborating with Fission and some other uh, partners in the industry to build this spec out. It's an evolution of the access control mechanisms that you're familiar with, um, like cookies and sessions and JWTs, but designed to put ownership in the hands of users. So UCANs are tied to user-owned private keys. To users, they feel like uh, touch ID, face ID. They feel like they control the material there. And then invocations, when they're run, are cryptographically signed by the user. So that takes away another class of bugs with replay attacks and makes it much safer to use this distributed authorization than using the old centralized authorization. Within the UCAN spec, capabilities like upload or query can be delegated. Delegation is just cryptographically how the capabilities are moved from one key pair to another. And you might delegate your account from your phone to your laptop. You might delegate uh, you know, the ability to recover your account to a account recovery service that you trust. It doesn't have to be owned by the app you're using. It's owned by the user. And delegation also gives you the ability to share access and capabilities with your friends. But in addition to giving users all this control, you can delegations open up new business models. For instance, with Web3 Storage, we make it trivial for applications to save into user paid accounts. So, uh, so that's the feel you get like, uh, if you've been using an app in the past that used a, a cloud storage provider and had you, you know, log it into your, uh, you know, whatever your cloud drive is. But we also make it easy to write code so the application owns the account and delegates access for the user to write into that account. UCAN delegations can invoke uh, services across the web. So it's even more flexible than I can describe because it's up to all of you to show us what it can do. Because the invocations are signed by the client, and there's no worry about replay attacks, the UCAN invocations can be safely forwarded for, through the network, allowing compute and data providers to collaborate on data pipelines that the user doesn't have to worry about any kind of location, which cloud, which server, any of that. So the, the headline for compute is that this allows us to move serverless functions from the cathedrals of the big cloud providers to the bazaar, where anyone can add functions to the network and anyone can call them. I'm excited to see what this means for distributed decentralized applications. So join me at 3.40 p.m. on the main stage for a code first view of how you can use UCANs in your application. And check out the Web3 storage blog for the technical details. Uh, thank you, I'll meet you in the back. Okay, 
Okay, that hit all my all my soft, flexible points there. There was discussions of UCANs and object capabilities, there was discussions of peer-to-peer, -peer, and there was discussions of the cathedral and the bazaar. I'm already too excited for this afternoon, but this afternoon is coming. It will be arriving approximately 1 p.m. here, so you have about 20 minutes. If you liked what you heard from uh, uh, J. Chris Anderson, uh, or if you liked what you heard from Sarah Mai and uh, the Filecoin virtual machine, if you liked what you heard from Ruben talking about the accelerator program, I can't do it immediately off the top of my head. If you like, if you like Nicola Greco and what he had to say about Crypto Lab, if you liked what you heard from Massa and the financial um, implications of building on Filecoin, and most of all, if you liked what you heard about human rights and civil liberties and changing the world one good step at a time, go and talk to Bryn O'Donnell and the rest of the crowd who are over there until one o'clock. So you have 20 minutes to meet some of the key players and talking about some of the key topics in the Filecoin ecosystem. In those 20 minutes, you can now run out, get some fresh air, you can have something to eat, but before you do that, you really should take these headsets back. I just have visions of everybody walking off, and uh, the mind meld is over now. Please return your headsets to uh, our amazing staff over there. Um, and once you've done that, go out, explore, see our amazing 3D uh, environment in the blue room, check out our sponsors' booths, and I'll see you back here at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.